I don't know about you, but、um, I haven't quite figured out exactly what technology means in my life. As I struggled to, to understand that, I came up with a way of framing the question that seemed to, to work for me in my investigation.、And、the question that it came up with was this question: What does technology want? And by that, I don't mean does it want chocolate or vanilla. By what it wants, I mean what are its inherent trends and biases? What are its tendencies over time? If we take technology's view of the world, what does it want? If we keep extending the origins of technology far back, I think we come back to life at some point. So that's where I want to begin my little exploration is in life. If we looked at the general shape of the approaches to hacking life, there are current consensus six kingdoms, six different broad approaches: the plants, the animals, the fungi, the protists, the little things, the bacteria, and the archaebacteria, the archies. Those are the general approaches to life. Each one of these has a different way of finding out how to do life. And if we take the long-term trends of life, if we begin to say what are the what does evolution want, there are several things that we see. One of the things about evolution is that nowhere on Earth have we ever been where we don't find life. Every long-distance drilling core into the center of rock, and we bring it up. There's bacteria in the pores of that rock, and wherever life is, it never retreats. It's ubiquitous. More and more of the inert matter of the globe is being touched and animated by life. The second thing is, is we see diversity. We also see specialization. We see the movement from a general purpose cell to the more specific and specialized. And we see a drift towards complexity. That's very intuitive. And actually, we have current data that does show that there is actual drift towards complexity over time. And the last thing is one of the things we see about life is that it moves from the in- inert to increasing sociability. And by that, it means that there is more and more of life. Whose entire environment is other life, and so the general long-term trends of evolution are roughly these five: ubiquity, diversity, specialization, complexity, and socialization. Now, I took that and said, "Okay, what are the long-term trends in, in technology?" Remarkably, I, I discovered that there's also a drift toward specialization. That、uh, we see there's a general hammer, and hammers become more and more specific over time. There's、um, Obviously, diversity, huge numbers of things. This is all the contents of a Japanese home. I actually had my daughter gave her a tally counter, and I gave her an assignment last summer to go around and count the number of species of technology in our household. And I came up with six thousand different species of products. I did some research and found out that the King of England, Henry VIII, had only about seven thousand items in his household, and he was the King of England, and that was the entire wealth of England at the time. So we're seeing huge numbers of, of diversity in the kinds of things. This is a scene from Star Wars, where the Thupio comes out and he sees machines making machines. How depraved! Well, this is actually what we're headed towards, where machines and the technology is only being surrounded by other technologies. Most machines will only ever be in contact with other technology, and not non-technology or even life. And thirdly, the idea that machines are becoming biological and complex is. At this point, a cliche. So the f- major trends in technology evolution actually are the same as in biological evolution. The same drives that we see towards ubiquity, towards diversity, towards socialization, towards complexity. That is maybe not a big surprise, because if we map out, say, the evolution of of armor, you can actually follow sort of an evolutionary type cladistic tree. I suggest that in fact. Technology is the seventh kingdom of life. That its operations, that how it works, is so similar that we can think of it as the seventh kingdom. And so it would be sort of approximately up there, coming out of, out of the animal kingdom. And if we were to do that, we would find out、uh, we could actually approach technology in this way. This is Niles Eldridge. He was the co-developer with Stephen Jay Gould of the theory of punctuated equilibrium. But as a sideline, he happens to collect cornets, and he's decided to do a morphological analysis and try to derive their genealogical history over time. This is his chart, which is not quite published yet. But what, the most interesting aspect about this is that if you look at those red lines at the bottom, those indicate a parentage of of, of a type of of cornet that was no longer made. That does not happen in biology. When something is extinct, you can't have it as your parent. But that does happen in technology, and it turns out that in fact, technologies don't die. So I, I suggested this to a historian of science, and he said, "Well, what about you know? Come on, what about steam cars? 
Now, they're, they're not around anymore. Well, actually, they are. In fact, they're so around that you can buy new parts for a Stanley Steam automobile. And this is a website of a guy who's selling brand new parts for the Stanley automobile. And the thing that really that I like is sort of this one click add to your cart button <laughs> for buying steam valves. And so I began to think about, well, maybe I should do this sort of in, a, in a more concerted way. So I took the great big 19, excuse me, 1895 Montgomery Wards catalog and I randomly went through it and I took a page, not quite a random page, I took a page that was actually more difficult than others because lots of the pages are filled with things that were still being made. But I took this page and I said, how many of these things are still being made? And not antiques. I want to know how many of these things are still in production. And the answer is, all of them. All of them are still being produced. So you've got corn shellers. Who, I mean, I don't know who needs a corn sheller. It'd be a corn shellers. You've got plows. You've got uh, fan mills. All these things. So in a certain sense, technologies don't die. In fact, um, you, can, you can buy for 50 bucks a Stone Age knife made exactly the same way that they were made 10,000 years ago, a shirt, bone handle, 50 bucks. Even when we try to get rid uh, of a technology, it's actually very hard. But I actually went back and took what I could find, the, the, the examples in history where there have been prohibitions against technology, and then I tried to find out when they, were, when they came back in, because they always came back in. And it turns out that the time, the duration of when they were outlawed and prohibited is decreasing over time. And that basically you can delay technology, but you can't kill it. So this makes sense because in a certain sense what culture is, is the accumulation of ideas. That's what it's for. It's so that ideas don't die out. If, so if you have life hacking, life means hacking the game of survival, then evolution is a way to extend the game by changing the rules of the game. And what technology is really about is better ways to evolve. That is what we call an infinite game. That's the definition of infinite game. A finite game is played to win. An infinite game is played to keep playing. And I believe that technology is actually a cosmic force. The origins of technology was not in 1829, but was actually at the beginning of the Big Bang. And at that moment, the entire huge billions of stars in the universe were compressed. The entire universe was compressed into a little quantum dot. And it was so tight in there, there was no room for any difference at all. That's the definition. There was no temperature. There was no difference whatsoever. And at the Big Bang, what it expanded was the potential for difference. So as it expands and as things expand, what we have is we have the potential for differences, diversity, options, choices, opportunities, possibilities, and freedoms. Those are all basically the same thing. And those are the things that technology bring us. And each time we make a new opportunity place, we're allowing a platform to make new ones. And I think it's really important because if you can imagine Mozart before the technology of the piano was invented, what a loss to society that would be. Imagine Van Gogh being born before the technologies of cheap oil paints. Imagine Hitchcock before the technologies of film. Somewhere today, there are millions of young children being born whose technology of, of self-expression has not yet been invented. We have a moral obligation to invent technology so that every person on the globe has the potential to realize their true difference. What we're trying to do with technology is find a good home for it. It's a terrible thing to spray DDT on, on cotton fields, but it's a really good thing to use to eliminate millions of cases of death due to malaria in a small village. Our humanity is actually defined by technology. All the things that we think that we really like about humanity is being driven by technology. When I think about what technology wants, I think that it has to do with the fact that every person here, and I really believe this, every person here has an assignment. And your assignment is to spend your life discovering what your assignment is. That recursive nature is the infinite game. And if you play that well, you'll have other people involved. So even that game extends and continues even when you're gone. That is the infinite game. And what technology is, is the medium in which we play that infinite game. And so I think we should embrace technology because it is an essential part of our journey to finding out who we are. Thank you.